everyone. Thank you for joining us at the Russian panel of Women in Tech World Tour. We're really happy to be here with you. Today, we're going to talk about change management, overcoming challenges, and turning them into opportunities. The topic of our discussion is thriving in times of crisis. I'm Elena Valeva, Women in Tech Ambassador in Russia and CEO and Founder of Threat Positivity. I'm going to moderate our conversation today. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce to you our first outstanding speaker. Christina Tichona is the general manager for Microsoft Russia. Christina has more than 20 years of experience in the areas of management, sales, business development, strategy, and customer relations, mostly from telecommunication industry, having worked for companies like Nokia and Bjorn. Christina holds an executive MBA from Russian Academy and of Science and Kingston University in UK, and honors degree in economics and finance from St. Petersburg University. So uh, Christina is going to talk to you uh, about envisioning the future of business leaderships. And uh, welcome, Christina. Thank you for joining us here today. And the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot, Yelena. And uh, hello, everyone. So I'm really happy to be here today. As Yelena introduced me already, um, I will just repeat. Uh, my name is Christina. I am uh, heading Microsoft Russia. Actually, I joined Microsoft Russia a little bit over than one year ago. So uh, I can tell I can tell you in Microsoft terms, I'm yet a small baby here <laughs> because it's quite a heavy onboarding. But I really enjoy it, and uh, the single reason I enjoy it, it's a great culture, and I think uh, this is the topic we are also going to explore today a lot. And I actually wanted to share with you a few slides, and to start with. Um, uh, to start with the thoughts um, about how actually the business is changing currently and what trends actually for the change of business we are seeing. Um, and I understand that many of us are seeing actually the situation and uh, trying to um, see the signals and the trends. So in no way I, I want you to take this as a single point of truth because there are so many angles. But uh, actually, this is just how we as Microsoft are seeing it and how we are trying to envision actually the future of the business and the requirements, the new requirements actually to the uh, business leadership in the post-pandemic world. So I think it uh, goes without, um, without saying that pandemic has changed our life uh, so dramatically, both our private life and our professional life. And um, I think many of you have heard uh, the words of our CEO, Satya Nadella, uh, which I think be became virus words. And he said, we've seen the two years worth of digital transformation in two months. And that's really the true, you know, also here in Russia, because before the crisis, before the pandemic, uh, many Russian cus uh, customers, our partners, uh, large businesses would have a transformation plans and would just go steadily to implement them. But I think the COVID-19 has been a forcing function in a way to speed up all those plans and even uh, transform the business in a way that was not imagined before. So I think the key topic here is actually not the digital transformation per se, but the speed of it. And um, actually, why the speed has accelerated is simply because I think all of us has felt how fragile can be the businesses and uh, the resilient operation had, had become really the top of mind for everybody. So the businesses uh, had to transform and will continue to transform just uh, to make sure they have a resilience and they have a flexibility in a situation that can change in quite unpredictable way. So talking about the future, what businesses should expect next, I think there are a lot of analysts which are trying their best actually to foresee and to read the signals and interpret the data. And I like actually one of the study and report uh, which was done recently by Ernst and Young. It's called COVID-19, uh, which critical choices should businesses make next, published recently. And the first is, is quite obvious, so it's more digital than ever. Um, quite going quite in line with the words of sites here that I quoted before. I think the key thing here is uh, the speed of transformation that we see now in these two months is probably will stay even after the COVID. So talking about uh, what will be their new speed, let's say, or new norm of transformation, it's more, uh, more likely to stay at the current speed. And I'm talking like daily talking to different CEOs, our customers and our partners, and some of them really were not imagining what they will have to do. 
for example, some of the classical retail businesses were saying like six months ago that they were they are not considering the e-commerce because they are traditional brick and mortar, and they it's it's their strength, right? Their presence, their uh, premises. Of course, it's not like this today, and more likely to stay and to continue digitize in the future as well. So the second trend, uh, which is which which starts uh, to be observed is a business is becoming more collaborative because in a digital uh, in a digital economy actually the boundaries between uh, the industry the, between the industries between the businesses are getting more blurry and actually companies are seeking for a new ways of collaboration and reimagining the collaboration in order to share the risk first of all but also to co-innovate uh, for example one thing that we are seeing now at microsoft is that we are co-innovating with some of our customers and it actually transforms um, our relationship. It's not anymore the relationships of vendor and the customer, it's relationship of uh, us and the partner. And we are going and co-selling together the new solutions, the new IP uh, to the other customers of Microsoft. So that's the trend which will be, I think, strengthened going forward. And uh, the last but not least, the changing consumer and employee behavior. I think I mentioned the retail example, and this is where the consumer behavior is clearly changing. Somebody who did not order, for example, food or non-food uh, through the internet um, had used to do it actually in these two months. And it's more likely that some of those habits will stay. And the same with the employees. Actually, I talked yesterday with some of the CEOs of large business, and he was saying, actually, we have a we have a pretty large office in St. Petersburg, one and a half thousand people, and we could not imagine that all of those people can work remotely and actually can work quite efficiently. So now we are asking ourselves, should we let all the people come back, or should we maybe um, retain a big chunk of uh, our teams and our employees? Uh, on the remote mode in the new reality. And I'm not even talking about the large uh, companies like Microsoft and um, you, you name it, right, who will probably remain in the hybrid mode for quite a long time and the hybrid mode might become a new norm. And what we also seen is that really the technology became uh, the key enabler actually to make those businesses resilient and uh, to make sure their operations are continuing. So, and first of all, uh, talking about like remote work, remote education, where we've seen some of the large universities in Russia, all the schools, you know, just to transform to digital education, not just in weeks, but actually in a few days has been quite a challenge. And of course, the technology is there as enabler is key, is, is very important, but it's not the only element because you should have a methodology, you should have a different, different way of doing things. But what we also seen from technology domain, actually some of the technology groups has just flourished uh, during the pandemic because actually the, the maturity of certain technologies has reached a certain stage. And particularly talking about the artificial intelligence. Just look uh, look at the number of scenarios where artificial intelligence has been applied now during the pandemic, starting with the medicine and diagnostics, where the artificial intelligence can be used um, just to analyze the medical images and uh, see the early signs of disease, for example. Then it has been used for the face recognition uh, by many governments in the world to see, for example, if the uh, masks are on the citizens or not. It has been used a uh, great way for the detecting the contact during the day so that the infected person could uh, potentially see which, which were the contacts during the day. And it, of course, has been used uh, for modeling because I think the modeling which was done uh, also during pandemic could not be possible without the algorithms and the machine learning uh, that artificial intelligence has. But then, of course, as, as I said, technology is just an enabler, right? And it's not enough. It, as always, it all starts with the people. It all starts with the culture and the mindset of adapting and learning. And I'd like to stay here for a while because it has been a great learning, I think, for each of us as a leader, as a manager, how we should adapt, how we should lead differently our teams. And I try to summarize what are the key things actually for myself 
And I came up with a list of five key topics, let's say, which are important for me as a leader and that I, I think is important to exercise just to support my team. So first of all, exercising the growth mindset. You probably came across this concept of growth mindset. It's quite a famous concept uh, of Carol Dweck, was adopted by um, Satya Nadella when he came six years ago to Microsoft and has been actually the cornerstone for Microsoft to change their culture. And what actually the growth mindset means, it means that we believe that the people abilities and the people skills can be changed, so it's not fixed. And even such, such things which are disputable, like for example, um, emotional intelligence, which is a very, very soft skill, and somebody can say it's a natural gift, but even this type of skills can be actually learned. So, and we as the leaders have also to exercise the growth mindset in this period, because some of the practices which were working well in the office environment are not working uh, in the new, let's say, remote environment. I will give you a very simple example. If you had some rhythm of communication, which was always successful for you, and actually is part of your successful management practices, it's not necessarily anymore supporting the way you want the team to collaborate. What we've done actually in Microsoft Russia, we completely changed the communication rhythm. We changed the, the rhythm of calls. We have daily syncs. We have more frequent communications with the employees, more frequent all hands. And it actually helps to uh, keep and to uh, build further our collaboration spirit. The second one is uh, leadership versus the management. What I mean here is that, of course, management is important as a function of performance uh, and making sure that the results are met, the deadlines are there, the standards are met. But the leadership is uh, kind of getting even more important because in these uncertain times, you have to motivate the team, you have to inspire the team, you have to help them actually to go through the challenges. Um, and, and you have also to, to be very open yourself right uh, as, a, as a leader and to listen your people because nobody nobody knows actually the secret sauce nobody knows what will happen tomorrow the third thing which is very important is the care element of, of you as a leader actually microsoft has a concept of uh, coach uh, coach and care and the care part is um, becoming very natural in this time because many of us has faced some challenges and actually different challenges because some of us are locked with the small kids at home and it's really hard to keep the usual business rhythm some of us have to give a care to uh, people uh, to our family members who, who might be sick some of us have some other challenges and it's really important for us as a leaders and as a managers to give in this time the care and empathy to our people so that they can really feel support and do their best. And I think especially talking about uh, women leadership, I think this is our natural strength probably. And I think this is the circumstances where we can exercise it with the great authenticity. And uh, believe me, I think your, your team and your team members, your employees will really appreciate that. And number four is uh, creating the space for emotional connect. Because uh, the way we communicate and the way we interact in a digital space is quite different versus being in the office. Because once you are in the office, you can feel the atmosphere, you can uh, go uh, to talk, to have a small talk with this employee, with that employee. You don't have it actually in the remote uh, world and you, you start to miss it. So that this emotional connect is also like really important and we try to find a space and uh, to create actually a digital space for employee to share their motivation, to share their inspiration. Just to give you an example, we have created a three channels for, for Microsoft employees. One channel is just to share some fourth inspiration and we have some volunteers there who is providing actually for the lessons at home. Uh, then we have another channel for the kids where we are helping actually to keep the kids busy with the good purpose, yeah, with the educational purpose. And the third channel is uh, to have some art sessions. And all of this, I think, uh, helps 
helps the uh, emotional uh, and mental health of the employees and helps to be emotionally connected. And uh, number five, last but not least, is the need to develop people. And I think this last one is probably the most important than ever, because as we discussed in the beginning, the speed of digital transformation which has just accelerated incredibly. Yeah, and it will continue to stay at accelerated pace. So it actually means that the need for people to catch up with the new technology, with the new skills that they need uh, to have, is also increasing. So it needs it means that the we as the business leaders have to spend more time and pay more attention to to the way how we develop the people and the share of time dedicated to the development. So I think there has been a lot of studies and a lot of good data points actually showing that first of all the businesses that are investing into their employee skilling are getting more payback in their investments. So it may sound kind of surprising, but really uh, that's that's the result of our of a studies. Secondly, the people who are motivated to train and to develop, they're also working more effectively. And altogether, I think it creates a learn it all culture. And if you think about the learn it all culture versus the know it all, know it all would mean that okay, I know everything, I don't I don't need to to learn. And believe me, I also had discussions like this with some of the employees. So it's not a kind of the theoretical case. And this learn it all culture goes all together actually with the growth mindset that um, I was talking about um, a minute ago. And the good thing, you know, uh, the good news is actually there are simple things that uh, we as leaders can do right away. And those simple things are not uh, requiring any budget or monetary resources or time resources and um, those are just few life hacks um, that you may find useful first of all how to how to spark the curiosity of people and make it in a really friendly environment so that they would really create a habit with them uh, to learn what we do for example is having a weekly virtual lunch and learn sessions where we invite one of the employees who has developed an interesting case or closed a uh, very uh, innovative deal so that he can share the case study and we can discuss it all together and we can learn from each other. Second one is give the people time and have space for learning. So it means that the learning cannot happen only at the weekend or holidays uh, as it happens very often. And it, it, this second one is really tough actually because we are so much in our to-do list every day, right, delivering on the results. So it's really important to give the time in the calendars for people, to time box the time for the education and to respect this, this time. We are not to over prioritize it but by something else. Number three is share learnings and development content with the team. Actually, it's great, uh, great pack of uh, free of charge resources currently, which you can enjoy and you can find them and share with your team. Talking about the Microsoft resources, for example, we have Microsoft platform MS Learn. Uh, it has a lot of free resources. It has a lot of uh, Russian speaking resources. Currently, we have more than 300,000 people on this platform. And I really believe it's a great source of uh, trainings, especially the technical in intensity trainings uh, for, for your people. And the second thing you might be interested to look at is the new course that we recently developed and launched um, together with INSEAD uh, business team, uh, business school. It's um, uh, AI for business course. And this is a kind of more practical course from business point of view, how you can use the AI technology. And, and it has a lot of insights from the business leaders across the world. And the resources that I mentioned are, are all free of charge. And the next one, the number four, is give employees the freedom to choose the skills and topics they want to learn. Because I think that's that's the best way to get them engaged into the learning, yeah? to let them learn what they want. And also let them learn what is um, what will help them in the career. And that goes into the next point, empowering the line managers to help employees to map the targeted skills into their career progression. So that actually employee would know exactly how the training and skilling program that he will undertake in the next six months would bring him closer to the next career step that he wants to undertake. 
So with all of that, actually, I would like to finish saying that probably the biggest challenges and the biggest opportunities can be realized through the collaboration and working together. And I think we as a leaders, the best thing we can do is just to create a culture of collaboration, culture of learning, so that it can spark actually the uh, innovation and ingenuity of people. So with that, let me thank you, and I wish all of us the next productive sessions together today. Hello again. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you for your for sharing your experience and insights with us. I really hope a, uh, people will listen carefully and adopt them uh, in order to overcome challenges uh, much easier and quickly. And also thank you for our sharing these uh, free resources that Microsoft has. Uh, we'll definitely uh, post them on our Women in Tech uh, social media accounts so people can reach them. Thank you again uh, very much for supporting Women in Tech and uh, uh, goodbye. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Helena. Goodbye. Uh, so uh, let me introduce to you our new uh, speaker, uh, Anna as Naminska. Uh, she's a woman with an incredible career, both in corporate tech industry and also a successful entrepreneur. Uh, now, Anna is the chief of growth, uh, uh, is the chief growth officer at Viber. And prior to joining Viber, she was a country manager for Apple services, managing businesses, uh, business results and local operations for App Store, iTunes, Apple Music and iCloud. Prior to that, Anna served as a chief digital officer, both for Eurasia at the own and Mindshare Russia. Uh, so, and also, as I've mentioned, uh, Anna is a well-known entrepreneur who started uh, several successful businesses, uh, including uh, e.ru, uh, it's a leading Russian online video streaming service, and Tinkoff Digital, a real-time bidding platform based on big data technologies launched in Russian retail bank Tinkoff. Uh, also, Anna was named uh, as one of the most, uh, one of top uh, 10 Russian internet entrepreneurs, according to Venture Village and the Moscow Times. Uh, thank you very much, Anna, for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to your uh, uh, tell us about five reasons uh, to join and start career in tech. Hi, uh, Lisa. Anna. Thank you very much, very much for your introduction. Hello, everyone. Really happy to have you here. Let me share my screen. I hope you can hear me well. Yeah, thank you very much. So five reasons to work in tech and especially in post pandemic world. So we all know that work in tech is something like very cool. A lot of people really want to go into this industry, first of all, because there is a lot of really interesting things happening there. There's a lot of new projects and companies in this industry, a wild, well known, like Apple, Facebook, Google, Uber, you know, all mass media really love to write about tech. And everybody knows that jobs in tech are really well paid. And it's not only about like salaries or bonuses, but also there is a lot of stories of people about people who joined, uh, for example, small startup and the startup was sold to one of the biggest corporations and somebody who used to work just for three years in this startup just became a multimillionaire. And also there's a lot of stories about free cookies or ping pong games or flexible working hours or even opportunity to lie on the couch in the office. So everybody's thinking that tech is something that um, is really good to work in. But I think especially for women and especially in post-pandemic world, there's so much more serious reason either to join uh, the industry and to have a career here or to continue to boost your career. So the first one I would, the, the first I would think, what is a new normal and why it's the right timing for, for, for women and to build a career in tech? So the first thing I want to talk about is basically that everything becomes tech. What it means? We usually get used to think about tech as a vertical, as all these big names that I, I just mentioned. But it's not anymore like this. Not only pure digital companies like Microsoft, or Apple, or Facebook is a tech. So basically, every vertical is becoming a tech right now. Because retail companies and retail chains, they need to go to a new operational and business models, selling their goods and services online, supporting their customers, 
trying to automate all the process that they can do. And they also need this new tech and digital leaders. It's also, let's say, when we talk about tech, is Citibank a tech or is Vodafone a tech? Probably we might say that this is like a banking and telco industry is nothing to do with tech, but it's not true anymore because these companies are completely digital right now. They do all the operations online. They acquire customers online. They serve customers online. They're trying to build the environment where all the operations can be done without leaving your home or your workspace. So I can say that basically every vertical now becoming tech but it's not only about the verticals but it's also about the functions because before probably people were thinking about tech in the company like there is some geeky guy sitting in it department doing some coding or maybe working as system administrators but basically every function right now is becoming digital it becomes tech so first of all we can name marketing so for sure marketing nowadays is all around digital so digital is the number one spending area for all marketers around the globe and around the globe and here we're not talking about only digital marketing as they say like banner advertising or search engine marketing but everything that we rely on data so data scientists are number one people that are really needed by marketing director because CMO wants to see all the funnel and all the way that user uh, joining the the company uh, as a client uh, will uh, will will go inside the funnel so um also not only marketing but also sales function for example the commercial director he's also very interesting interested in uh, selling the goods through online and it's not only about let's create an online shop and let's sell our goods online but it's also the integration with like marketplaces or how we can use social media to sell our goods online or how we can use chatbots and messengers, for example, to talk to our customers. Also, customer support is one of the most digitalized functions right now. So if you talk about, let's say, big B2C companies like telco or banking or travel or retail, when you have hundreds of thousands or even million customers, you need to serve them. And artificial intelligence and chatbots and all, let's say, remote opportunities to serve your customers online, like mobile application or the website, will help you here. So that's why a lot of people who can work in these areas are needed. So it's not only by verticals, in verticals and functions, but also organizations that before probably were never considered as a part of the tech ecosystem company um, organizations like um, non-commercial and non-governmental organizations, NGO, uh, also need a tech specialist. So for example, we in Viber, we did a partnership with World Health Organization during this COVID-19 situation to fight fake news and disinformation. We made an interactive chatbot. We localized this chatbot on 23 languages and it got in just a few weeks, 3 million subscribers. So basically it means that on our partner side, there is also some people who are head of digital or digital managers that needs to know how to work with emerging technologies and how World Health Organization can use emerging technologies to make their program more popular and to expand and to expand their impact on the world. Another example that we need is governmental partnerships in many countries around the globe. We did more than 110 official COVID-19 communities, including Russia, Ukraine, Hungary, Philippines, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, many, many countries. We got over 15 million members worldwide. And it's also a good example how local health authorities and governments can use messaging apps and social media to inform the citizens and uh, people around the globe about 
COVID-19 and basically what's what, what's happening and give them all the new all the news and important information. So the second reason is definitely the high demand for workforce, for qualified workforce in tech. So if you look at the United States last year in 2019, there was 4.6 million job openings in US in tech industry. But if you look at Russia, it's the same. So in like our major websites, hh.ru, where you have a lot of uh, open postings, you can see that IT tech and digital um, industries have the biggest amount of job openings with 25% growth comparing to last year. So basically it's like one quarter. And what is interesting that there is 17% more roles than CVs. So we can see that definitely there is a lack of people and there is a high demand. But it's a lot of opportunities for women because if you look at the United States, you will see that women still underrepresented in tech. And for sure in Russia and in many other countries is the same. So big companies like Facebook, uh, Google, Microsoft and Apple, you still can see that um, women are taking a very few percentage of tech jobs. Leadership jobs are a bit higher, but still you cannot compare it with men. And definitely there is room for improvement here. The reason number three is that now we can say that it's not anymore like a work from home policy. I would say it's work from anywhere. Uh, there is a funny picture from New Yorker magazine that kids are bringing desk salad to mom and mom has a little office on her bed. So you probably have heard that Facebook, Google and Amazon, they expanded the work from home policy till end of the year. CEO of Twitter a couple of weeks ago have said ha has said that people can stay at home forever. They don't need to go to the office. We at Rakuten um, being a part, we are Viber being part of a big Rakuten corporation. We're also thinking about some kind of like a blended solution where people can work from home or from the office or from anywhere they want and everything will be voluntarily. So I think for women, it gives great opportunity to have this work-life balance that they're seeking, uh, looking for and definitely check the industry where they can find it. There is a number four I would name that in tech industry, especially now, there is the smartest minds around because the level of problems that needs to be solved are becoming became very serious every year. And uh, why it's important for women to be in this industry, because it's very important to have a mentor, to have a mentor or to have a buddy in the beginning when you start your job in the in any big corporation. So I think why tech is definitely uh, winning here because still this industry is quite young and corporate culture, uh, corporate cultures in these companies are very open. So it means that nobody will discourage women from growing in this company and uh, from becoming a leader, a true leader. And you can find a lot of smart people who will help you um, to grow. And for sure, around tech, there is a lot of like smart minds from great universities and a lot of problem solvers. So it's just very, very interesting place to be. And the reason number five I want to mention is uh, basically that I think it's important for every woman that you cannot only let's say, go to your office or work from home and like make money and get your salary. But you also want to make an impact, right? It's like very important. And I think tech is one of the amazing industries. And especially now, as we saw in this like pandemic world, so tech was a window to everything. It was a window to buy goods. It was a window to order services. It was your window to your family and friends. And to the job that you have to do anyway to get your wage. So what will be the future in this case? So first of all, it's a lot of development of local communities. 
Small and medium businesses are struggling around the globe because of pandemic and digital technologies can definitely uh, bring to these businesses new clients through a client's acquisition, client serving, opportunities to sell online, opportunities to advertise online. Um, another topic is that digital technologies uh, help people to get access to essential services that they need. Uh, for example, it's everything about, let's say, money transferring or micropayments. And so when people live in uh, emerging countries, for example, um, we in Viber, we do have a lot of audience in countries like Myanmar, Iraq, Philippines, Algeria. A lot of people in these countries, they don't have access, let's say, to a banking system. They don't have like bank offices in their villages, right? So they need some emerging technologies that they can use for micropayments or money transferring. Another topic, for example, is Ye vouchers. Now we are talking with World Food Program uh, to make a partnership and to use Ye vouchers, for example, in countries like Libya. So poor people can get a voucher, Ye voucher through the messaging app and they can exchange it on real food. So that's an example how uh, emerging technologies can help uh, poor people around the globe uh, to get access to essential services. Another topic is definitely the communication with beloved ones. So we all use social media and messaging apps to communicate with family, friends, but some companies are going even beyond this. For example, Facebook has a partnerships for a lot of telco companies around the globe to do zero rating program. So what it basically means, it means that if the person has no money for internet, he can have, let's say, up to 10 websites or mobile application that he can use for free. So it gives opportunity to communicate with family and friends. And the last, but definitely not the least, is that emerging technologies help, help saving people's lives. And it's not just, uh, you know, brave words. We all probably remember when there was like a tsunami in Thailand and people, people got know it from Twitter. Or for example, we in Viber has a lot of stories when refugees from Iraq could find their family only because they used the application. So I think everybody can find a lot of examples how... Um, digital technologies, communication apps, social medias, mobile apps really helped uh, hundreds of millions of people around the globe. And I think there is something that working in tech, you will be really, really proud of because you definitely make your part. So there is a top five reason to work in tech that I was talking about. And uh, I'm, that's my presentation is over and I really hope that uh, if you work in tech, you will be developing your career and if you're still thinking, I really welcome you in this amazing industry. Thank you, Thank you Anna. <laughs> Thank you very much for this presentation. I'm sure that people who hesitated before now are truly convinced uh, <laughs> during the uh, career in tech industry and IT. Uh, thank you for bringing up uh, this socially important and positive impact. Uh, it's, especially during these times, uh, it's uh, vitally important and essential for everyone. Uh, and uh, I'll be happy to continue this conversation with you and two other amazing speakers uh, that joined us. Um, here with us, uh, Maria Lesnich. Uh, Marina has worked for Dell Technologies for more than 13 years. Uh, she has uh, uh, expanded her role and leads a highly distributed team focused on building an ad ecosystem that nurtures and promotes innovation across all engineers' team in the storage division globally. Uh, she's an active uh, member of the Women in Action at DAC Technologies since uh, uh, 2014, including a tenure in a co-lead role, uh, as well as being an executive sponsor for Women in Action chapter since uh, 2018. Thank you, Marina, for joining us here today. And we also have Yekaterina Mitusova. Uh, Yekaterina 
uh, after five years in marketing for B2B say, uh, service companies, uh, she uh, moved uh, to, G to IT as a digital marketing professional uh, and sales, uh, channel sales partner manager at Google. After Google, she moved to Reich, uh, and now Ekaterina is managing an, the international customer success team at this company. Uh, thank you, Kate, for joining us today. Now the whole world is experienced uh, experiencing turbulent times and changes are hard both for people and individuals. Uh, it requires a strong growth mindset, as uh, Christina said at her first keynote speech, and also resilience uh, to quickly adopt to changes. That is why for our discussion panel, we choose the topic change management, uh, a curse or a blessing. So uh, Ekaterina, let me address the first question to you. Why are people resistant to changes? Uh, and what are psychological and cultural aspects of changes? Yeah, thank you, Lina, for the introduction and for this question. So when the change is initiated, there is usually a very, very positive intention behind it. So for example, we drop our bad habits to adopt a better lifestyle, or companies introducing the new software to make life of their employees more efficient and allow more time for valuable work. But according to McKinsey, 71% of all the change management initiatives globally fail because change is a very, very complicated thing. First of all, there are different levels of changes. It can be a country level or a cultural level. It can be an organizational level and a personal or psychological level. And the most important, there should be a plan. Plan preparing for the change, collecting feedback, implementation, and then communicating the change. And there should be a why behind the change. And that's why people are resistant. They're lacking the why. And this is once again based on the multiple level. Thanks to Christina, we've already touched upon the growth mindset concept. And this is very, very important. There is a growth mindset on one hand. And people are open to change. They perceive it as the opportunity. They will be your drivers of change. They're ready to fail. They're ready to learn. And they're ready to accept the feedback. But on the other scale, this is the fixed mindset. And mindset is based on beliefs and fears. And people with the fixed mindset will be your change detractors. They base uh, their beliefs and fears that leaders are born and not made, you know, that they have the specific set of skills, they're really afraid to fail, and they perceive feedback as the criticism. So when you introduce change, those detractors will ask you, why this hasn't been consulted with me? What's in it for me with this change? And you should keep in mind that they are based on fears. People may be afraid to lose their job, or they may be afraid that the change will show their incompetence or they feel a failure. So this is just the one level. We can also speak about the organizational level. So usually we speak about four types of organizational culture. This is ad hocracy, like innovation startup culture, this is clan, family-like culture, hierarchy, very formal one, and then market, very result-driven. And depending on the type of culture, change is perceived differently. For example, family-like clan culture, they're really avoiding the conflict. So when change is bringing the conflict or some unpleasant results, it's really hard for them to overcome it. For hierarchical culture, you should really document and build instruction for every single type of change. Everything should be there as the playbook. And I also want to speak and you know, just briefly touch upon the country level or the cultural level. Some, some cultures are really open to change. Some cultures are not. There is a high and low context cultures. For example, if your country has gone through a lot of you know, political, economical changes that haven't brought a lot of you know, positive results, you will perceive everything as a threat at the higher level. So bear in mind, there, there are different layers. There is a mindset. And also there are different beliefs and fears that stand behind the changes. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, you've mentioned several aspects, uh, also cultural differences. Uh, but since it's a Women in Tech conference, uh, we'd like to talk more about uh, gender differences. Uh, so Marina, based on your experience and observations, how do women adapt to changes? Uh, that's actually a um, pretty interesting uh, question. Thanks, Alina, and thanks for the introduction, uh, introduction by the way. So um, uh, the thing is that I am—I uh, I actually don't think that there is, a, you know, the right answer to the question who 
better um, you know, manage or adapt or accept the changes, whether it's men or women. So based on my observations and uh, some, you know, some little experience, I think truly believe in that, that um, you know, men uh, better manage the changes while women better adopt and accept the changes. And you know, uh, listening to what Christina was talking about, you know, about nature, about women, she was talking about leadership, that it's natural for women. I'm also thinking that adapting the changes is also something that is in our nature. Like, uh, uh, like just giving you a small example, I have my team, which is, you know, our multinational team their my team members are in different countries and i'm a true believer that the women coming back from the maternity leave they're even you know twice as effective as they were before and again it's because of the nature it's because of the something of, of the multitasking we're doing and i'm pretty sure that a lot of um, you know current workshops will tell you that the word multitasking does not exist but again, I'm a true believer that it is, and women can do those things because it's a kind of our nature. But I also want to cover in, you know, in this question, in this particular gender question, I want to cover, you know, two more things uh, that to my mind are really that important. One is, and uh, you know, think about that, uh, changes lead to opportunities. And Christina already mentioned, and I believe Anne also mentioned about opportunities. Uh, so there are a lot of opportunities and it's not just uh, limited to job opportunities like, you know, in tech market and in tech industry. It's about uh, terminology, opportunities, like are we seeking for opportunities? Are we open for opportunities? Are we ready and happy to accept these opportunities? Because, you know, uh, um, just a couple of examples. Um, Recently, I was invited to lead one of the project, which is, you know, with their US based interns. And I would tell you that I would never be invited there uh, in a normal world, just because that is like, you know, in person project. But since, you know, now the reality changed and it's a, a new normal reality, new opportunities, uh, their boundaries are uh, transparent. So actually, in some of the cases, there are no boundaries. So there are much more opportunities. We just need to, you know, turn around to seek for the opportunities and be able to take and uh, to accept these opportunities, especially for women, because, you know, naturally we are pretty uh, uh, shy. Um, and the other thing is um, that I want to, to mention, you know, first was opportunities and the second is inspiration. I, again, I truly believe that inspiration is their engine for changes. Look, you know, we there are a lot of, especially women in technology and in, in, in that technologies, there are a lot of gold, a lot of talented women around, the same as in other companies, but we hear about them much less than about men, you know, in technology. So, uh, and sometimes when we hear some inspiring stories from others, from other uh, women, it makes the others, you know, move forward, be more active. So looking at others' inspiring success stories, really very helpful. And what we do, let's, uh, let's say one of the examples uh, in Dell Technologies, we made a women in technology video across the whole company when uh, women changed their stories. And it was like, you know, a, a wonderful, um, um, how to say, uh, impulse for the other women to start innovating, to start changing. And that that is something that leads to positive changes, especially for women. Thank you, Marina. Uh, I really like how our conversations uh, shifts from challenges and crisis to opportunities and spreading. Uh, that was uh, the goal of our panel. And uh, to talk more about that, uh, Anna, how, uh, could you tell us more about how to boost your career in times of crisis? I think it's interesting, continuing what uh, Marina was saying about uh, how women should be inspired by other women. I think there is something that uh, needs to be fixed uh, 
in women in general is basically the behavior and um, how we is a self confidence. So especially in times of crisis, there is I would say that there is like a two ways of behavior. I would call it like you know like a snail and tiger. So some people they behave like a snail. So if something is happening, they're just starting to sit, you know, in their little houses, not moving anywhere, being like afraid of everything's happening, and just to wait when everything will be over. But other people they behave as a tigers. So they see the opportunity and they're just ready for a jump. So I think that crisis especially in the tech is definitely time for being a tiger because you can have um, you can have different ways so for example let's say if your company is doing well uh, definitely you can grow like together with the company it will be like new opportunities for example areas like e-commerce or like collaborative tools video communication social media ad tech these industries are growing uh, biomed tech for example like huge growing industry right now but for example if your company is kind of like in the, in the middle on the verge of not like really growing but also not falling down but just in order to be on the safe side you know i know that like a lot of cfos usually trying to cut you know they cut some people they cut some expenses so maybe there is a good opportunity for some women uh, to take new uh, responsibilities so they can say that yeah okay this department was cut or maybe some positions were cut it so can i have the opportunity to take it can i be a leader of this function so you can show yourself and can try to take some leadership and ownership right now in this time of crisis just because there is more like free free room and um if if the situation is worse for example your company is not doing well and some industries as you know for example like mobility industry let's say uber gets uh, airbnb booking home so companies who are, who are working in travel marketplaces mobility uh these type of industries and there is like two ways the first one is definitely an opportunity to find a new job and there's a lot of job openings and companies that are doing much better but also it can be another opportunity that women can consider right now maybe there is a time to take a break and maybe there is a time to get some new skills and to learn to spend this time for education and to get some new uh, skills and professional capabilities because usually, um, you know, like a lot of people usually go, for example, for an MBA in times of crisis. So if you look back in 2008 or 2014, there was a lot of like MBA spike. So um, maybe just not necessarily some uh, kind of like a really big um, education, but um, maybe just to take this opportunity is a, is a great break to expand and to boost your professional capabilities or to find a new great job. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you for these uh, inspirational thoughts. Uh, and to continue this conversation about uh, change management, uh, nowadays we're experiencing uh, so many changes uh, all over the world. And do we need to accept the idea that constant changes are the new norm? Uh, Marina, what do you think about that? I think that the short answer is yes. So we, the better we accept that, <laughs> the better we adapt it, um, there, uh, the, the easier would be um, our understanding of their, um, you know, overall route and the next steps. For sure, we don't know what is going to be tomorrow, like Christina mentioned in her presentation. And there are a lot of challenges ahead. But yes. Um, it, there might be dramatic changes in the IT industry or in, in other businesses for sure. Uh, but I think uh, th there should not be an, an fear. So I, I truly believe that, yes, we, we do have to, to do this next step. Thank you. Uh, so also, uh, Anna, you've mentioned uh, that leaders are the ones who are responsible for uh, leading these changes and encouraging teams. So what do you think, uh, like how, uh, as a leader, you should train and support your team to overcome crisis? How do you uh, manage that at your workplace? Uh, I would love to have a playbook that I could like open and read how to do it, but unfortunately, 
it doesn't exist because there is something that we have not uh, we haven't seen before and uh, for me as a leader and having especially teams like around the globe um it, it's kind of like a challenging so first of all i think that that christina already mentioned that we need to come for um being a boss to being a leader and that's a, like a different behavior so for sure you do have you know like kpis and the strategy and the things you need to do but you just need to have to be um much more i would say um patience because you need to have uh you need to give time uh to your team uh to get used to this new reality and a lot of time during our video calls we have like kids running around or cats you know just sitting in front of camera and uh, we need to be flexible and we need to give more um, more opportunities um, to be flexible to our co-workers as well uh, the other thing uh, the other thing i think um, we need to have not only meetings to work but also try to have meetings just for non-working topics just like non-topic there is no topic and there is no title for this meeting so we can talk about um, families and we can ask more questions and definitely now we have to spend more time starting every meeting we need to spend more time for kind of like a small talks trying to understand uh, you know like the mood of our employees how they're doing like what's happening in their families it's it's very important and I think maybe the last advice is to smile, because uh, you know um, when you when you physically sit in the same office with people, you can feel this attitude and like you understand uh, what's going on on the other side. And now it's very difficult because you see like in a little screen your uh, co-workers and colleagues. So the more you smile, <laughs> there is more chances that you give this attitude to people. Yes, it's really important. The power of smile. Thank you. Uh, and Kate, to end our discussion at the positive side, uh, what positive sides of changes uh, can you mention, uh, especially in times of uncertainty? Yeah, I'll just sum up what Anna and Marina said. So first of all, is the multiple outcomes and the opportunities, as Anna mentioned, maybe it's time to learn to adopt the growth mindset and learn the new skills or, you know, right now the change is forced. It's like taking a plaster, from a scar tissue that is still there and uh, you are forced to do something maybe it's layoffs or crisis in your, uh, in your department or a company but adopt the mindset and learn something new and find a new job and support each other and this leads me to a second point which is compassion and empathy we're all right now at stay-at-home mode we're all stressed we don't know what's going to happen you know next week or even tomorrow we wait some news from our governments regarding when businesses will be opened and we will be allowed to go out somewhere uh, be compassionate to yourself and to your colleagues and i even feel it with the clients people become more open they share you know their stories kids they can tell you hey that's my grandma say hi to my grandma on the call you know cats dogs everything but be um, compassionate to yourself to your colleagues to your clients and to your friends and family. And the last one, I want to mention that the change is inclusive. It is a global change, global pandemic, so it doesn't choose the country. And right now, all the moms out there can feel the pressure and they are staying at home with their families, parents, and their partners. And finally, we can all say that it's the second job, you know, coming home and then cooking and having kids. And it's not just us saying that, it's pretty evident for everyone who is there. So, there is always a positive side. There is always a light in the end of the tunnel. It's really important the perspective that you adopt on this change. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And also we have one minute to answer the question from the audience. So Laurie, please uh, let in e Lydia. Uh, she has a question from the audience. Yes, uh, we have Lydia. Thank you. Hello. I think we've inspired the audience for uh, for making a career in tech. And uh, the question that we have is, what is the recipe of success for building a successful multinational career in tech? So maybe what, uh, each of you can share a part of this formula. Uh, may I have one, 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 one simple phrase? Do not afraid to, uh, to seek and take the opportunities. That's my recipe.
mine would be do not underestimate your achievements. And ad I adopted the motto, it's better try and regret than not to try and regret. So I would recommend this one. Yeah, and also I, I completely agree with what my colleagues said before. I also think that self-confidence and um, a capability to make yourself, um, to describe yourself, I mean, to describe yourself very well in like your CVs or be prepared for interviews is also kind of a uh, part of the job because usually women are much more modest and, you know, I always saying this, that let's say if you have a great job opening and you have 100 um, requirements and if women will have 99, she will be still thinking, should she apply or not? And if the guy and the, the man will have 20, he will definitely apply. So I think that the main point is being, being self-confident in all your achievements. Yes. Thank you, ladies, for this answer. And also, uh, Anna, Katerina, and Marina, thank you very much for joining us today and for sharing your insight and experience. Uh, and thank you, the audience, for watching. We really appreciate that you spent this hour with us. And we want to encourage you uh, to embrace uh, changes uh, and embrace crisis and uh, uh, set your mindset for growth uh, and uh, seek for opportunities uh, and not be threatened by challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much.